Dear brother, please leave this battle to us and retire to the safety of the camp. You know that we both have never let you down and shall trounce on those insolent lechers yet again. Yes, brother, I second our dear brother here. He speaks rightly. You should watch us crush those uncouth usurpers from the high ground and not soil your hands. My dear brothers, I do not doubt your abilities and intentions even for a second. After all, you both are Sakshat, Lakshmana and Bharata reincarnated. But I have attained this ripe age without ever disgracing myself and I have no whatsoever intention to disgrace myself with cowardice and escapism at the end of my life. Anyone here who is afraid, you can leave right now and go back to your homes while you are alive. But oh, exalted Raya, says the general meekly. The Raya thunders back with a searing glance. This is no occasion to take precaution against children who will flee on the first sound of the lion's roar. Bring my horse. Are you doing all right, O oh mighty Raya? The mockery was deafening. Embrace the true faith, O oh fallen Raya, and your life will be spared. My fate has brought me to you. You do have the last laugh today. But my Narayana will be with me forever. O oh Sultan, I pray to you to cease this pointless discussion with this infidel. Make away with his head right now. Before his son, Adil Shah, arrives, I hear he's already on his way. Not before long, he'll be here and whisk him away to safety. A loud thud. The head hit the ground and rolled off as the fine Persian carpet was splattered with hot blood. A blood-curdling shriek of the Sultan drowns out the thunder of the cannons outside for a few seconds. There I have my vengeance finally. Let the Almighty Allah judge, punish or reward me as he deems fit. Splattered blood of the enemy drips off his lips and his thirst for revenge finally quenched. Bring me all the wine. Today I drink to my heart's content. And present me the coat sculptor right away so he can make a bust of this wretched man's severed head and have it put on my capital fort's gutter. Also pour a drink to this wretched infidel's head. He can use a drink. Saying this, the Sultan howls into a drunken laughter as the lifeless eyes stare at him. Begum Khunza shudders for a second at the near demonic howl. Then an equally demonic smile cuts through her stoic face. Drunk with revenge, an unimaginable sense of power takes possession of him. He feels like a man at last. Hello listeners, welcome to Itihasa, a Indic history podcast and you're listening to episode 10 of season Vijayanagara. What you heard earlier was a dramatization of some moments that transpired on the fateful day of the Battle of Tallikota that saw the end of our tragic hero, Alia Ramaraya, and brought dark clouds over the empire. If you haven't heard the first three episodes already, then you should, or you would be missing out on action and drama around this fascinating character of Ramaraya. In the usual narratives, the Battle of Tallikota is not just referred to as a watershed event, but also as the end of Vijayanagara. While the former is accurate, the latter is a very loose and abrupt explanation of the real events that transpired after Tallikota. Did the Vijayanagara Empire's hegemony break after the decisive defeat at Tallikota? Yes, sure did. 
Did Humpy fall? Yes, it did. But none of these translated into the total collapse of the empire till at least 1640s. The empire was just too big to disintegrate in a single day. But the process had begun that day and the clock started ticking. In this episode, we will dig in depth to trace the events that immediately transpired after Vijayanagara armies rout on the fields of Raka Sitangadi or also known as the Likota. The primary sources for this particular episode that I have referred in detail are a scholarly work published in 1927 called The Aravidu Dynasty by respected historian Reverend Henry Harris who was a professor of the Indian history in St Xavier's College Bombay and the authority on South Indian history in 1957 Padma Bhushan awardee for his contributions to Indian history K A Nilakantha Shastri whose masterful work Further Sources of Vijayanagara History Volume 1 was published in 1946 Farishta has this to say about the massacre of Vijayanagara soldiers as they fled from the field after witnessing the head of Ramaraya on the spike quote the river was dyed red with their blood it is computed by the best authorities that the above 100000 infidels were slain during the action and in the pursuit and quote while there are a couple of muslim chroniclers who agree with farishta's body count of the enemy soldiers it's most definitely an exaggeration by farishta it was the norm those days to exaggerate the body count in a battle it probably it is still today too we have seen in the previous episodes how farishta has a tendency to not only fudge the events at times but also the fact that he was writing about the likota a full 40 years after it happened here to help us we have another source called burhan e masir written by a shia and a persian sayed ali tabataba who came to the court of burhan nizam shah ii of nizam shahi dynasty of the kingdom of ahmednagar Though these chronicles by Sayyid were finished in 1590, 25 years after the Likota, they seem to be much more realistic in Melod. It's an important source in that Sayyid gives the supposed body count as give or take additional 9,000 Vijayanagara soldiers who were slain after they started fleeing the battlefield, which makes it clear that while both the opposing armies did lose substantial number of soldiers during the battle. Vijayanagara still didn't have enough to field yet another army. Numbers weren't the problem like we saw in the second episode. The problem was qualitative inferiority of its army and loss of leadership. The same Burhani Masir also reveals to us that Ramaraya's battle camp fell into the hands of the Muslims and the victors got their hands on jewels, ornaments, furniture, camels tents gold standards maid servants men servants arms armor in great quantity the maratha account of the battle camp plunder puts the value at 12,357 huns a hun is a vijayanagara gold coin weighing 3.4 grams it was the used dollar of the day widely accepted and respected for its purity So an inflation adjusted value of 12 million huns would be around 2.2 billion US dollars today which is a lot of money Now we come to the question of what happened to the remaining two brothers of the decapitated Ramaraya In the first episode if you remember I told you that Trimalaraya lost one eye but survived and fled to the capital Hampi And what was the fate of last brother Venkatadri As per the European chroniclers Caesar Frederick, Anquetil du Perron, and Diogo do Couto, they agree with each other on the assessment that Benkatadri had died of serious wounds on the battlefield. Is this a slam dunk case proving the death of Benkatadri like I told you in the first episode? Well, no, it isn't. Where would be the fun of listening to a podcast if I revealed everything in the first episode itself? Like I told you in the season intro, this is not going to be a straight dry run season. 
it's too interesting and dramatic to be ruined by chronological narration so coming back to venkatadri's survival the evidence for this surprisingly comes from farishta himself in my opinion farishta didn't have enough wiggle room to fabricate venkatadri's death not that he had a motive or else he might have probably done it as it would be a good propaganda for his sultan to have defeated and killed ramaraya's both brothers so why was farishta's hand forced to not fudge this detail i think it's simple there was enough social institutional and recorded evidence that could call out his bluff right away reverend henry harris quotes h krishna shastri's work the third vijayanagara dynasty published in 1911 or 1912 in his work krishna shastri refers to the 17th century's contemporary source ramarajyamu this was verified against 16th century sources and here is an excerpt from it quote the combined armies of nizam shah yadul khana yadul khana meaning adil shah and qutub sahu which means qutub shah all together gave up the hope of capturing him him here is venkatadri end of quote the crucial evidence supposedly comes from the krishnapuram venkatachalapati temple in tirunelveli district in tamil nadu this temple construction was finished sometime between 1563 to 1572 and commissioned by krishnappa nayaka son of vishwanatha nayaka we will talk about vishwanatha nayaka in a dedicated episode on the 17th century ethno historical classic rai vachakam in this temple there is an inscription and five copper plates issued in the name of the puppet emperor sadasivaraya in 1567 which is 2 years after the battle of tallikota in these copper plates venkatadri's continued presence is also spoken of as a matter of fact and that he shone on earth as a hero and a conqueror in my opinion this is a pretty strong evidence as it's highly improbable Sadasivaraya or Venkatadri's elder brother Trimalaraya would have gone to such great lengths to cover up Venkatadri's death. And what would be the motive to hide his death? And why suppress his martyrdom if at all he died in pitch battle? Now the question as to why the earlier confusion of Venkatadri's death. I think partly it was a classic case of fog of war that obscured Venkatadri's escape when he saw it was a losing battle and maybe laziness on the part of later chroniclers who relied on dubious sources or hearsay or maybe they also felt he wasn't too important enough to focus on after a point it is hinted that venkatadri escaped to a distant fortress now such a fortress has to be down south in vijayanagara domains instead of up north which was where the deccan sultanates were stronger It is said that Venkatadri might have escaped to the Chandragiri fort near Tirupati and it makes complete sense as we saw in previous episodes Chandragiri was the Ramaraya and Aravidu family's home base so it's only logical that Venkatadri would go where he would be safe and strong and this indeed would be a distant fortress from the perspective of the Deccan sultans as it was deep in the south where they couldn't reach yet The historian Henry Harris also quotes Farishta to point out that before the sultans left Hampi after 6 months of their sojourn in that city they received an embassy from Venkatadri looks like he agreed to surrender some contested areas and domains to them as a ceasefire offering if this is indeed Venkatadri then he must have been indeed in Chandragiri as that would have allowed him to communicate with Tirumala in Penukonda but it's also important to note that later in his work Henry Harris mentions an account on different matter by Farishta which he says was a case of mistaken identity wherein Farishta confuses Tirumala with Venkatadri it might be plausible the embassy was from Tirumala instead so this might not be a great evidence 
but still it's something to keep in mind now let's come back to tirumala raya the brother of fallen rama raya for a long time i had wondered why tirumala raya and venkatadri raya did not put up at least a token resistance at the gates of hampi to buy some more time for the people of hampi could the situation have been salvaged if they made a resolute stand why leave such an important capital city to the invaders who arrived only on the fourth day after the defeat at tallikota why did tirumala raya return to the capital hurriedly take the entire treasury on probably 600 to 1000 elephants along with the puppet emperor sadasiva raya and rushed to the fortress of penakonda the sudden capture and execution of rama raya on the battlefield and the resulting rout of vijayanagara army at tallikota clearly led to a shell shock moment for not just the remaining army but also whatever leadership that remained after the battle the people of hampi were in a denial initially then fear took them over and finally confusion set in as a hordes of bandits robbers and soon the deccan sultanate's armies descended their morale and will to fight was completely broken the vijayanagara polity too lost total confidence and abandoned the people along with the capital i think this was one of the most shameful moments in all of vijayanagara's existence so the fear confusion and loss of morale was one reason as to why no fight was put up most sources on this aspect tend to stop at this point but in my personal opinion though i think this is what happened If you remember in episode 2 we explored the reasons for the military defeat of Vijayanagara army. If you also remember I mentioned of the lack of advanced fortifications and no presence of artillery on the bastion walls of Hampi. This was a real weakness against any army with advanced artillery. No such city could stand a chance against a siege and only fall or surrender quickly. the defenders would have had no choice but offer the attackers a battle outside the walls vijayanagara's overconfidence on its strategic depth over reliance on its army's ability to defeat the enemy before it approached its walls kind of fooled it into not embracing proactively the innovations and fortifications from a defensive perspective while the deccan sultans for a long time have been embracing these innovations upgrading themselves vijayanagara for most of its existence had followed a defensive offensive strategy when it came to the deccan sultanates in addition to ramaraya's gunboat diplomacy this led to it totally discounting the need to increase hampi static defensive capabilities and this is what i think led tirumala raya to abandon the city in addition to the sapped morale of his remaining army if one accepts the accuracy of the vijayanagara army's body count of 9000 give or take soldiers recorded in burhani masir then on the paper vijayanagara should have had at least 6 to 10 times more of that number as its reserve forces which tirumala could call upon at least in later time but since that didn't happen it might be safe to assume that most of the army dispersed deserted or went back to their provinces to the nayakas there is no way that the whole army perished it would be a fantastical concoction there are no credible sources to back this up nilakanta shastri estimates that tirumala raya carried away approximately 100 million sterling pounds of 1946 value which is probably 5.46 billion dollars in 2020 so tirumala raya carried away that kind of money or bullion from hampi's royal treasury on the back of approximately 1550 elephants all the political elite and nobles of the city too followed tirumala raya and sadasiva raya to penakonda logically without any authority and the army left to defend the capital Hampi was bare open to both the anti-social elements of the day and the Islamic armies. First, let's look at Henry Harris's version of what transpired in Hampi 
after Tirumala Raya and the remaining army fled to Penukunda. It's important we look at this so we can contrast it against K.A. Nilakanta Shastri's version and get a coherent picture from the composite of both. Henry Harris claims in his work that the Muslim armies arrived in the capital on the 10th day. As soon as the Sultan's armies entered the city, they took out a procession through the city to intimidate the citizens of the Hampi. As they carried Ramaraya's head on a spear, to the horror of the onlooking citizens. This would have literally paralyzed them with fear. After this orchestrated victory procession, the army set about in mutilating some of the glorious edifices belonging to Tulava dynasty especially and many other landmarks of Hampi. Henry says the Lakshmi Narasimha statue was immediately mutilated by the soldiers after the procession. while the sultans took up their residences in the royal palaces and their harems in the zanana enclosure which is a very popular tourist destination today henry also confirms that the victorious armies spent 6 months in hampi again which is widely accepted and recorded after this the troops were occupied in plundering the city and its surroundings he quotes caesar frederick quote The soldiers were searching under houses and in all places for money and the other things that were hidden. The booty was enormous." Unquote. He also quotes Koto and the Portuguese chronicler Faria e Sousa as sources when he says, quote, Ali Adil Shah caught from the spoil a diamond as large as a hen's egg. and this was affixed to the base of the plume on the headdress of his favorite horse he also got multitude of jewels and precious things unquote till here henry harris's understanding of what transpired is in line with the mainline research of even today but it is here henry asks an interesting question here is excerpt quote was this sack so destructive as it has been supposed I regret to say that Mr. Su, whom we rightly call the pioneer historian of Vijayanagara, has completely misdescribed the state of Vijayanagara as caused by the Muhammadans during those six months. More than three centuries have elapsed since those memorable days, and time is as sure a destroyer as man. His statement is perhaps founded on the Muhammadan authors. who seemed to give a picture of a most tremendous havoc unquote in short henry harris is saying that it was time and desolation that ruined hampi instead of the victorious muslim armies and that the court chroniclers of deccan sultans were probably hallucinating and embellishing events that never happened let's look at another interesting excerpt by henry harris now quote I do not doubt that many a temple was desecrated in those days that many idols were partially broken or completely destroyed or that several shrines were perhaps razed to the ground with the fanatical iconoclasts but I cannot admit Farishta saying that the chief buildings were razed to the ground for the simple reasons that the chief buildings of the capital of the whole Hindu empire may be partly seen even now his religious prejudice against the idols and the temples of the unbelievers made him suppose things done in the imperial city of which its invaders were never guilty unquote so the important question that we need to ask here is are the court chroniclers of the sultans exaggerating what were destruction their sultans did in hampi or is a henry harris inadvertently underplaying it by taking an apologist stone without even realizing while farishta is notorious at times for concocting and embellishing stuff to aggrandize his sultan it's a bit surprising that henry on one hand concedes of their rampant iconoclasm in those days and the other hand accuses farishta and others of cooking up fantastical stories about the pillage and destructions even when the sultans didn't do all of that in short henry is implying 
the Deccan sultans for some reason deviated from the then prevailing iconoclastic tendencies but then as their chroniclers to show them as violent invaders censoring any peaceful acts of them thinking about this i don't think it really makes any sense because why would any invader who was generous go to great lengths to turn himself into a monster through his court chronicles then henry also says that several edifices of the city were destroyed by the invaders partly while searching for treasures and partly by the order of ahmednagar sultan hussein nizam shah he also points out how the poor inhabitants of the city were searched by the muslim soldiers and when found tortured till something was extracted from them so let me present you some interesting bits on henry's assessment on what happened in hampi post talikota the clays bear his thinking here is one of the excerpts in question quote anyhow the muslim sovereigns did not intend to destroy vijayanagara that long 6 months stay within its walls seems to demonstrate their purpose of retaining the city for themselves unquote for a second let's take this specific excerpt on face value and let's run with this for a while why and how is henry harris so sure about the deccan sultan's intentions that we don't know so sure that he completely trashes the official court chronicler accounts too henry harris to this shows as evidence the construction or presence of a royal bathhouse of sorts on the east side of the royal enclosure then he shows the famous elephant stable the lotus mahal in the zanana grounds and the octagonal pavilion on the road to hampi as per henry harris these constructions are not built in pure hindu vijayanagara style of architecture instead they are built in a fusion of hindu and saracenic or islamic architectures with a signature bijapuri masonry till here at least you know the mainland research kind of agrees with henry it is well recorded that many famous monuments in hampi do exhibit a fusion architecture though the mainstream consensus is that this fusion architecture reflected the cosmopolitan and pluralistic nature of vijayanagara where it infused the islamic elements into its architecture pretty freely this again reflects not just an architecture but also in many aspects of the royal and cosmopolitan life in hampi we will explore this in a separate episode let's now contrast this mainstream consensus against henry's own opinion quote such was the secret of the masons of bijapur but these reasons i'm inclined to believe that the buildings mentioned above were the work of the deccani sultans during their sojourn in the capital of the hindu empire unquote at this point henry tries to entirely anchor his analysis on a quote from the qutub shahi court chronicle basatin us salatin or also known as dastur ul amal written by mirza ibrahim al zabari who was a contemporary chronicler of abdullah qutub shah sometime in 17th century let's look at this excerpt now quote after this battle of talikota the sultans devoted their attention to vijayanagara and raised mighty and lofty buildings it's really interesting to see that henry harris for some reason consciously chooses to ignore farishta and other muslim or european accounts of the talikota aftermath but then cherry picks a specific excerpt from basatin us salatin which was composed no less than 80 to 85 years after the battle and then he ignores another important excerpt from the same source of basatin us salatin for some reason which i will quote now quote during the course of 20 days that they remained at the seat of war the sultans took their ease and nursed the wounded and sick then they turned toward vijayanagar where they raised the lofty building and temples to the ground the work of destruction was carried out with a vengeance vijayanagara was an extensive city flourishing and well populated 
it had never experienced any foreign invasion for ages the nobility the wealthy the soldiery the peasants and the artisans all drove a roaring trade during the confusion and disorder following the muslim invasion the citizens out of fear lurked in their houses cellars wells and reservoirs those that were well to do betook themselves to the neighboring mountains and caverns with their family and chattels the muslim army remained at vijayanagara for about 6 months to a distance of 20 leagues around the city everything was burnt and reduced to ashes unquote so we are never told by henry harris why he chose to ignore this important excerpt from the same source But in this next excerpt it becomes clear that Henry Harris was either groping in the dark or was completely on a wrong track. Quote Yet 6 months after the triumphal arrival at the end of July or at the beginning of August of the same year in 1565 they with their respective armies left Vijayanagara. They departed to their own kingdom because they were not able to maintain such a kingdom. as that was so far distant from their own country unquote if we look at this excerpt it completely demolishes and contradicts his own initial assessment of the sultans wanting to retain the city for themselves this is a complete u turn by henry harris so he is implying that it took the sultans a full 6 months to realize the naked fact that it's strategically and militarily untenable for them to hold the city of hampi due to it being too far from their sphere of influence and all the while the deccan sultans were happily building romantic edifices in hampi and entertaining the silly idea of co-ruling hampi or dividing it all up until one fine day they realized it was all a pipe dream and it's better to peacefully leave the city without destroying most of the stuff of course after some token iconoclasm of the city So the chroniclers have something to harp about their Islamic iconoclasm credentials. If this is what Henry Harris was implying, then I choose to not hesitate to call out that this is really silly and nonsensical, considering the fact that all the Deccan sultans were arch rivals, and their alliance was very opportunistic and only temporary, as it would soon collapse, like we would see soon. so they would have never agreed to any arrangement of co-ruling or dividing hampi up when they know it's difficult to hold it the only logical option left for them would be to molest that city as much as possible in a way that vijayanagara royal claim on the city only weakens significantly as we saw in the episode prisoner of hampi the power of the emperor comes from the city and its temples destroying and damaging the important architecture in the city would also damage the royal claim on the throne of vijayanagara and their own legitimacy in a fine research paper titled the fall of vijayanagara reconsidered by mark t lesset and kathleen d morrison show how the eponymous capital city of this empire was largely abandoned following the defeat of the tolava dynasty's imperial army at kallikota in 1565 And in this paper they show how areas of the city were burned, looted, and many of its monumental temple complexes, gateways and images were left in ruins. However, and despite an historical tradition emphasizing the total destruction of the city, the level and focus of destruction was strikingly variable. And last but not least, by sacking the city thoroughly, the sultans effectively had ensured then none of them would be able to find any use for it so it is more like it's neither mine nor yours if only the sultans wanted to possess one of the richest cities in the world with a thriving economy they wouldn't have destroyed it it doesn't make sense instead just co-opting it into their own empires would have actually made them a lot wealthier and richer Another interesting thing to note is Henry Harris says the combined armies of sultans cannot hold the city even after his stress on the Vijayanagara army perishing at Talikota. The question that now arises is 
did the Vijayanagara army perish or not? If it did, how many were the casualties? And was the chronicler Syed undercoating the casualty figures? If so, what was the abnormal motive? In my opinion, the unwillingness of the combined Muslim armies to hold the city is a clear proof of the potency of Vijayanagara to still field an army and launch a counterattack on its capital to take it back from the Muslim forces. There was no romantic self-realization setting on the sultans and neither was there sojourn in Hampi a peaceful one like we will see in a bit. So one has to call out the contradictory aspects of Henry's analysis on Tallikota's aftermath where he fits the data to his theory instead of doing it the other way around. Barring some issues like this, his work on the Arabidu dynasty is a fantastic one nevertheless. I also think Henry Harris was at a disadvantage as an historian due to lack of better archaeological data in comparison to historians who came after him or historians and researchers who came after Hampi was declared as an heritage site by the Indian government post independence. So he ended up seeing some of these monuments as cultural outliers in the middle of an Hindu capital. And this was probably making him sound like an apologist today to us. Instead, at that time, he probably was only trying to be fair to the Deccan Sultans, instead of peddling any overarching ideological agenda. So I think in this aspect, he should get a benefit of doubt in spite of his suboptimal analysis. Now let's look at K.A. Nilakanta Shastri's account of the aftermath in Hampi. His account is important not only because of him being a definitive authority on South Indian history, but more so because he taps into much stronger and much reliable contemporary sources called Kaifiyats. Kaifiyat is an Urdu word that loosely translates into situation or condition, put into a written statement. Many villages and towns used to use these kaifiyats as a way to record important events that transpired or were happening. Think of it as a primitive form of a medium like Twitter or Facebook wall posts that run commentaries on events of the day minus the fake news. They used to be based on themes like social, political, economic or military. Nilakanta Shastri writes in chapter 22 of his work the further sources of Vijayanagara history, Volume 1, that the Muhammadans entered the city without any resistance, smashed the idols, demolished the temples, set fire to the palaces and buildings, plundered the people, abducted women, and enslaved the men. Shastri also quotes the poet Rudra from his work Nirank Sopakyanam, the Kaifiyats of Pushpagiri, Kaifiyats of Kadapa and Kalagyana written by the Lingayat saint Emmaya Basava when he talks about the systematic plunder, iconoclasm in Hampi, massacres in nearby villages. Here is an excerpt from this chapter. Quote, During the six months when the Muhammadans halted at Vijayanagara, they ravaged the neighborhood most systematically. Not one village in the whole of Rayal Seema escaped the Muhammadan scourge. People fled in panic from their homes and took refuge in hills and jungles or migrated to remote places. When at last the Muhammadans departed from Vijayanagara, they left the city and its neighborhood a vast heap of smoldering ruins. No house escaped fire, no temples remained undestroyed, and no idols stood with all their limbs intact." Unquote. It's clear from Shastri's European chroniclers Basatin us Salatin descriptions that they paint a much more tragic and devastating picture of the immediate aftermath of the Lakota in comparison to Henry Harris's apologetic and diluted descriptions. Having said that, it's important to point out that both the Shastri's descriptions and Henry Harris's descriptions do concur on an important fact that though Vijayanagara was sacked and plundered, it was not totally destroyed, and that most of the inhabitants returned after the invaders left. Here, let's look at an excerpt from Kathleen de Morrison's The Fall of Vijayanagara Reconsidered. 
court against this one might argue that although the capital was indeed abandoned by many of its elite residents the realm did contain other cities and in the end only a small chunk of imperial territory was lost closer to the ground it is clear from archaeological evidence that the great majority of the rural population continued to live and work in the region and even that the extensive irrigation features and lands watered by the tungabhadra river lands in sight and near the city continued to be maintained and used Kathleen also adds that despite the importance accorded to the sacking of Vijayanagara in a world in which conquest and plunder were not rare there is almost nothing written about patterns of abandonment and destruction in and around the city after 1565 it makes sense when you think about it one only has to ask where would people displaced by such a tragedy go they will only want to go back to what they call home once the danger has passed that's a natural human reaction we can witness this in many cities that bounce back after the carnage of world war 2 especially a city like berlin that was bombed into submission in the end of the allied bombing campaign it looked like the ruins of hiroshima but still its citizens came back immediately repopulated and rebuilt it in no less than 5 years Similarly citizens of Hampi as we saw earlier did everything to rehabilitate themselves in their plundered capital but it ceased to be the seat of the government and fell into decay gradually with the forces of nature and entropy engulfing the beautiful city after some time This is not to say that Tirumala Raya or the polity didn't do everything they could to kick start the city's engine and keep it going once again but Tirumala Raya had to ultimately abandon the capital once again after his failed attempt with this we end the current episode in which we explored the immediate aftermath of the lakota from the perspective of the glorious capital hampi in the next episode we will explore the reasons for Tirumala Raya being forced to abandon the capital permanently and falling back to penukonda We will also look into the rule and legacy of Tirumala Raya during such a critical time for the empire that was threatening to unravel itself fast. If you like the content of this episode and the show, please do hit the subscribe button and leave a rating or a review. A huge thank you for taking the time to listen to the show. I hope to see you soon in the next episode. Till then, this is Narendra Vikram, your host and narrator. signing off hope you have a great week ahead